Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello viewers, welcome to this next lecture on the NPTEL MOOC course on Mathematical Portfolio Theory. You would recall that in the previous week we talked mostly about utility theory and we talked about what are the characteristic of utility functions, uh, particularly in the context of the risk attitude of investors. And then we talked about maximization of expected utility in terms of its definition. And uh, we talked about the two important concept uh, extending the basic definition of utility, namely uh, absolute risk aversion and the relative risk aversion. And we looked at uh, some common examples of utility functions uh, in the context of the preceding discussion on the properties that risk neutral or risk averse investor who is also a rational investor and we tabulated those properties. And then uh, we were planning on moving on to the next discussion on using utility theory in the context of portfolio optimization. So, that is the topic that we are going to start off in today's lecture. So, as I said, uh, we will talk about portfolio analysis using utility functions. So, when we talk about uh, utility functions, this is something investor specific and so we say that uh, we let the investors utility function be denoted by some u which is f of w. Uh, now, it can be shown that the expected utility of a portfolio. So, this is the utility function. So, consequently you can calculate the expected utility of a portfolio and it can be shown that it is a function of the portfolios mean and variance of returns. Uh, of course, in addition to possibly other parameters. So, in other words, the expected utility becomes a function of the mean and the variance of the wealth w. So, uh, let me be more specific with this result which gives a quantitative formulation of this. So, the expected utility of the wealth, this can be shown that as the function of the expected wealth plus uh, f double prime of expected wealth divided by 2 factorial into sigma w square. So, the expected utility which is E of E w is a function of the mean which is this and variance which is this term of the wealth w. 
All right. Uh, so now, uh, by looking at the form of the result, uh, one can immediately guess that this has been derived uh, making use of the Taylor series. So accordingly, uh, we take the Taylor series expansion of the function u. So that means we take the Taylor series expansion of this u of w about now since I have the term e of w so this indicates to me that I will take the Taylor series expansion about the expected value e of w. So therefore uh, e of w I can rewrite this as u of e of w plus w minus e of w and this is f of e of w plus w minus e of w and now we do the Taylor series expansion. So, this is going to be f of e of w plus f prime of e of w into w minus e of w plus the third term will be uh, f double prime of e of w over 2 factorial into w minus e of w whole square and then I have the remaining term of n derivative of e of w over n factorial into w minus e of w raised to n n is equal to 3 to infinity. Uh, so, here I specify where f n is the nth derivative function. So, next we take the expectation of uh, this relation. So, then the expected utility is E of u of w is equal to f of e of w. So, here w is basically the deterministic wealth level. So, its expectation is going to be f of e of w plus f prime of e of w uh, which again is a deterministic quantity. So, and within bracket I have expected value of w minus e of w plus f double prime of e of w over 2 factorial into expected value of this term here w minus e of w square plus summation n is equal to 3 to infinity. This term remains as it is. So, the n derivative evaluated at e of w over n factorial and then we have expectation of w minus e of w raised to n. Uh, so, now we approximate that means we ignore the higher order terms. That means we ignore these terms here. We obtain that E of U of W is approximately F of E of W. And now remember that this term is something that is going to be 0 because E of W minus E of W is 0. And then we have F double prime of E of W over 2 factorial and this term by definition this is sigma w square. So, this is sigma w square and this term here this is ignored. So, that means that we have obtained our result that we had stated here. Now, uh, we recall that the one period return on an investment 
of W naught. Uh, so, W naught which uh, gives terminal wealth W t. So, that means you have a time window uh, 0 to t. You start off with a wealth W naught and your terminal wealth is W t. Uh, so, W naught is deterministic and W t is uh, random. This is given by the following relation. So, this will be W t minus W naught over W naught and I will denote this by R p. So, therefore, E of W t from this relation is W naught into 1 plus E of R p and uh, we get sigma W t square is going to be w naught square into sigma p square, where E of R p introduced here and sigma p square introduced here denote the portfolios. So, the investment was on a portfolio. So, the portfolios p's mean return and variance of returns over the period respectively. Uh, so, thus we get, so what we had? We had earlier we had the relation E of U of W is approximately F of E of W plus F double prime E of W over 2 factorial into sigma W square. This implies that now instead of W we will have W T. So, expected utility of W T is approximately F of expected value of W T which is W naught into 1 plus E R P plus F double prime of expected value. So, this is going to be uh, again expected value of W t. So, this is again going to be W naught into 1 plus E r p over 2 factorial multiplied by uh, sigma t W t square which is W naught square into sigma p square. Uh, so, now we can say that uh, since W naught is a given constant. The expected utility of the terminal wealth. So, this is the utility of the terminal wealth W t and it this entire term is then going to be the expected utility of the terminal wealth. This is a function of the mean that is E of R p and variance sigma p square and there is the E of R p here. So, mean and variance of the returns namely E of R p and sigma p square respectively. Uh, so, that is E of u of w t is going to be some function f of E of r p and sigma p square. So, let us now look at uh, an example to elucidate it in a better better manner. So, for this we will look at a quadratic utility function So, let u of w uh, be given by some beta of w minus gamma w square uh, where uh, as indicated in the previous class, this 
coefficients that is the parameters beta and gamma these are positive constants. So, therefore, u of w t is going to be beta of w t minus gamma of w t square. Now, this can be written remember w t is nothing but w naught into 1 plus r p. So, I am replacing w t with the beta term minus gamma into w naught into 1 plus r p square and this can be written as a plus b r p minus c r p square where a is equal to beta w naught minus gamma w naught square b is equal to beta w naught minus twice gamma w naught square and c is equal to gamma w naught square. So, uh, from, uh, from this context we can conclude the following. So, I will make two points here. Uh, so, thus the utility function uh, that are quadratic in W t. So, that means it, this, if I consider the quadratic utility function then they are also quadratic in R p. So, this term here and secondly also expected utility of the terminal wealth what is this going to be? This is going to be for the quadratic utility function this is going to be beta w t minus gamma w t square and uh, by the linearity property this is going to be beta into e of w t minus gamma into e of w t square and this can be written as beta of e of w t minus gamma into e of w t square plus sigma w square. So, what I have done here is I have made use of the fact that sigma w square is going to be e of w t square minus e of w t whole square. So, I have just made use of the fact that sigma w square is e of w t square minus e of w t whole square. So, uh, therefore, the portfolio analysis based on the quadratic utility function is identical to the standard mean variance analysis. Uh, so, this means basically for example, if I am trying to uh, maximize the expected utility, then uh, this would be the same as minimizing the sigma w square for example. So, this is one place you can reconcile this with the uh, mean variance framework. Uh, so, next we come to uh, our normally distributed returns. Uh, so, the usage of the expected utility approach results in the investors maximizing their expected utility even in presence of uncertainty. Uh, so, suppose that for a portfolio P, 
the number of outcomes is discrete then its expected utility is uh, which will denote by expected utility of WP this is going to be summation of the utility of the terminal wealth uh, in the ith scenario into the corresponding probability of the terminal wealth in that scenario where i have considered that there are k scenarios or uh, k possible outcomes uh, so where k is the number of possible outcomes and w t superscript i is the terminal wealth in case of the ith outcome and p i w t of i is the probability of the ith outcome uh, so this means that uh, i have a k number of outcomes which i will de designate it as i equal to 1 to k then the terminal wealth level for each of those ith outcomes will be given by wt superscript i and u of wt superscript i will be the utility and the corresponding probability of the ith outcome is be denoted by pi of wt of i so then I basically this uh, wealth WP uh, of the portfolio, the utility of that is going to be given rather the expected utility of this is going to be given by the definition of the, uh, of the expectation where the random, I have k number of random variables. So, U of WP takes k possible different values as a random variable which will denote as u w subscript to superscript i with the corresponding probability be given by p i. So, this is something like summation random variable into the corresponding probability to get the expectation and remember that this is for the discrete case. Now, uh, alternatively, uh, so we will take a q from here the way uh, the expected utility is defined here and uh, alternatively. when the outcomes are continuously uh, distributed, the expected utility is given by Uh, expected u of w p this will be given by u of w subscript t into probability w subscript t with respect to the random variable w t and going from minus infinity to infinity uh, where i have introduced this new notation p of w t is the probability density function for the terminal wealth associated with the portfolio P. Uh, so, this is nothing but just the uh, continuous time definition of the expectation of a random variable. Uh, so, I can say that uh, therefore, for any utility function u of w, u of w e of u w p this depends obviously on p of w t the probability density function. Uh, so, now let us look at a particular case. 
So, uh, in case the probability density function is normally distributed, then it will be of the form p of w t, remember that w t here is a random variable, uh, is equal to 1 over square root of twice pi sigma of w subscript t into exponential of minus of w t minus e of w t square over twice sigma square w t. Okay, now, let us uh, move on to non-normal distribution. of returns. Uh, so, let me first begin with a motivation for this. Uh, so, I state that there is uh, empirical evidence that means, data based evidence that asset returns are not normally distributed. It has been observed that the unconditional distribution of asset returns have non symmetric. highly peaked and longer tail characteristics. Uh, so, uh, th there, there is a basic assumption that you know the returns are uh, of an asset are normally distributed, so which means that they are going to be following a normal random variable. And then, uh, because the normal distribution is symmetric, uh, one would assume that uh, this using the normal distribution to look at the asset return uh, would be consistent uh, with uh, the actual distribution of returns. Uh, however, in practice, when you look at the returns and you look at the, uh, if you plot the histogram and then smoothen it out, then you notice that uh, there are certain characteristics that are exhibited by the actual empirical data that are not consistent with the normal distribution and I have identified three of them here. Uh, one of them it is non-symmetric that means it is skewed on one side, uh, one of them is highly peaked. So, that means that the peak of the bell shaped normal distribution is much more in, in case of the actual uh, did, uh, so, uh, in case of the actual uh, empirical distribution. So, that means that the peak will be higher if you plot the actual distribution as compared to the normal distribution with the same uh, parameters and it has longer tail characteristics. So, compared to uh, the thickness of the tails of the two distributions on both sides in case of normal distribution, in reality the distribution of returns will exhibit uh, tails which are thicker than what you would get in case of a normal distribution. Okay, so, next what we will do is that we will enumerate some of the distributions uh, which are not normal, but which are closer to reality in terms of fitting uh, what is going to be uh, this uh, non-symmetric and highly picked and longer tail characteristic that are exhibited by the returns. So, accordingly uh, some statistical distribution that uh, capture these features are a stable Parisian distribution. The students t distribution mixtures of normal distribution, Poisson, 
jump diffusion process and uh, finally, log normal distribution and we are going to uh, discuss this log normal distribution uh, in a little more detail. Okay, so, just to do a recap, let us recall that for continuously compounded return, what did we have? So, we had that uh, if the rate of interest rate of return is say r t dot and if this if the interest payments are happening m times in a year, then the compounding factor is going to be 1 plus r t dot over m raised to m. And if you want this to happen in a uh, the co compounding uh, happening in a continuous manner, you would recall that we had let m tends to infinity and uh, this was this give, gave us limit as m tends to infinity 1 plus r t dot over m uh, raised to m over r t dot and the whole thing raised to r t dot. And this limit be, be came out to be e raised to r t dot. Now, remember, uh, so let us see this in the context. So, this means that if you start off with an amount p naught then uh, you will basically get your p t to be equal to p naught into e raised to r t dot. But in order to ascertain the return, uh, the return is going to be given by a rate r t so that p t becomes p naught into 1 plus r t. Uh, so, therefore, we can write that e raised to r t dot. So, equating this and these two terms and cancelling p naught, we will get uh, e raised to r t dot is equal to 1 plus RT. And here RT is the holding period return. Okay, uh, so, therefore, uh, we can say that this RT dot, so from this expression, this is going to be uh, equal to the log of 1 plus RT. And what was RT? So, if you start off with instead of P naught and PT, so when you are talking about holding period return, so we are actually considering some interval PT minus 1 to PT. So, uh, we start off with, uh, so actually I should be, let me just correct this uh, for consistency, let me write p t minus 1, uh, let me write this say p t minus 1 and I write this as p subscript t minus 1. Okay, so, this means that my r t is simply going to be equal to uh, p t minus p t minus 1 over p t minus 1. All right. So, then uh, this means that uh, this will give me that uh, 1 plus r t is going to be simply p t over p t minus 1. So, therefore, uh, log of 1 plus r t this is going to be log of p t over p t minus 1. This is what we are known as the log returns. Uh, so, just uh, to visualize this uh, non normal and normal. So, this is what uh, the normal distribution would look like. So, if I were to uh, plot the return against the probability of that return based on historical data, if it was normal, then the data would fit this normal distribution curve. Uh, but in reality, it is going to be fit something like this. Uh, so, this is the log normal distribution. So, if I say that uh, the asset returns are fitting a log normal distribution, it is going to look something like this as compared to the normal distribution. Okay, uh, so, now if r t dot has normal distribution with mean mu dot and variance sigma dot square, so that r t dot follows normal distribution with mean me, uh, mu dot and variance sigma dot square, then the h p r that is the holding period return r t this is said to have log normal 
distribution. All right. Uh, so it's a HPR uh, which is one plus RT uh, or uh, simply RT. Right. So uh, this is brings us a definition of log normal distribution. That here, if your RT RT dot follows a normal distribution. Uh, with mean mu dot and sigma dot square. Since this random variable is equal to natural log of 1 plus RT, so then uh, we say that this, so that means that a natural log of 1 plus RT is going to follow a normal distribution. So this accordingly I can say that 1 plus RT or its scaling which is simply RT will follow a log normal distribution. So here the random variable under consideration is RT. And since natural log of 1 plus RT follows a normal distribution and you remember that a normally distributed random variable is, is one uh, whose log follows a normal distribution and since here uh, log of 1 plus RT follows a normal distribution therefore the random variable of 1 plus RT by definition of log normal distribution uh, follows. So 1 plus RT is a log random uh, log normal random variate. And since you know 1 is just a scaling factor, so uh, 1 plus RT minus 1 that is RT is also a log normal distribution. So in reality what happens is that as compared to the returns, the holding period returns if you fit empirically uh, and if you fit it to a normal distribution and if you take the log of the returns and you fit, fit it to normal distribution, that means if we fit it to a log normal distribution, it is observed that the log normal distribution gives a more realistic fit to the empirical data as compared to the normal distribution. Okay, uh, so I will straight away use a property from log, log normal distribution. So then the mean and variance of 1 plus RT, remember 1 plus RT follows a log normal distribution. So its mean and variance is going to be E of 1 plus RT, I will denote it by mu and I will denote the variance of 1 plus RT to be equal to sigma square. Now since this is a log normal distribution, so this will be given by exponential of mu dot plus half sigma dot square and this will be given by variance is going to be given by, remember that mu dot and sigma dot these are for r dot distribution and mu and sigma square are for the 1 plus rt random variable. Uh, so coming back to sigma square, this will be given by exponential of twice mu dot plus twice sigma dot square minus exponential of twice mu dot plus sigma dot square. Now this will be given by mu square, mu square means you would recall that this is mu, so the mu square is simply going to be equal to exponent of twice mu dot plus sigma dot square. So I am just making use of that here, I am taking out this factor and all I am left with then now is exponential of sigma dot square minus 1. Uh, also, the median of 1 plus RT is uh, exponential of mu dot and mode of 1 plus RT is exponential of mu dot minus sigma dot square. Okay, so now that we have talked about uh, the properties of log normality in the context of recognizing the fact that the historical uh, returns data uh, be based on the empirical analysis results in uh, the historical data being more amenable and more uh, uh, realistic in terms of fitting the distribution to a log normal distribution as compared to a normal distribution. So now that we have talked about the log normality of returns, let us now move on to uh, the discussion on log normality in the context of portfolio analysis. So therefore we start uh, this topic of portfolio analysis under log normality. Okay, uh, so for this let us assume that the returns are log normally distributed. Now uh, the continuously compounded return 
rt dot can be converted to the standard normal random variate what is this this is z subscript t which is rt dot minus mu dot over sigma dot and this follows a n 0 1 distribution uh, remember that uh, your uh, rt dot that is the continuously compounded rate followed a normal distribution with mean mu dot and sigma dot square so i have just done the uh, transformation we have already or standardization so I just recall the concept of standardization when we had introduced uh, aspects of probability theory okay uh, so this conversion or standardization renders the portfolio analysis much simpler so it makes the analysis much simpler now rt dot so we come back to rt dot is ln of 1 plus rt that is natural log of 1 plus rt and remember uh, from here our rt dot can be written in terms of mu dot and sigma dot so rt dot is going to be uh, mu plus sigma z zt so this is going to be uh, mu dot plus zt dot sigma dot and so therefore wt which is equal to w naught so i'll now drop subscript t so wt which is equal to w naught into 1 plus r remember this r is basically for the holding period return this is going to be equal to w naught into e raised to r dot which is the uh, continuously compounded return and this r dot from here I will get this to be w naught is equal to e raised to mu plus z sigma dot mu dot plus z sigma dot. Uh, so, accordingly to maximize the expected utility uh, of the terminal wealth. the investor will choose the portfolio that will maximize the following expected utility equation. Uh, so, what is Wt? Uh, Wt is given by this relation. So, the expected utility of this will now be given by utility of Wt which is W naught into e raised to mu dot plus z sigma dot integral of this from minus infinity to infinity and the probability density function so here the random variable is z so the probability density function is going to be f of z and this integral is with respect to dz so we next determine how the return and risk effect the expected utility all right uh, so we'll look at these two points uh, in terms of uh, sensitivity to return and sensitivity to risk uh, so accordingly uh, we'll start off with this form of the expected utility and take the partial derivative of this with respect to mu dot and sigma dot square so the partial derivatives of uh, the expected utility uh, with respect to so we are the return that is mu dot this indicates the effect of 
maximizing return mu dot for a given risk plus sigma dot. So, accordingly using the chain rule, we have, so I will take the partial derivative of the expected utility of the terminal wealth with respect to mu dot. Now, the chain rule will give me the partial derivative of the expected utility of terminal wealth with respect to the terminal wealth multiplied by the terminal wealth partial derivative with respect to mu dot. Now, this is going to be given by, so first of all let me look at this term. So, I will take this partial derivative with respect to W t. So, I will take the partial derivative of this with respect to W t under integration sign. So, this will give me minus infinity to infinity del u w t over del w t into w t into f of z dz. Now, here uh, we have used del w t del mu dot is equal to w t. All right. So, basically we have done the differentiation under integration sign which takes care of this, uh, the partial derivative of this and then f of z dz remains. And then for the remaining term here, I have made use of this relation uh, out here. Okay, uh, also, uh, we note that f of z being a probability density function is greater than 0 as well as del u del w t partial derivative of u with respect to t. Remember the partial derivative of u, first derivative of the utility function is always going to be positive for a rational investor. So, accordingly this term is positive, uh, this term obviously is positive and f of z is always positive. So, this means that since all the terms are positive, so this is always going to be greater than 0. All right. Uh, so, now we come to the next point. So, the second point is uh, we take the partial derivative now with respect to the uh, sigma dot. So, the partial derivative of expected utility uh, with respect to sigma dot indicates the effect of minimizing sigma dot for a given mu dot. Uh, so, again using the chain rule, we obtain the partial derivative of the expected utility of terminal wealth with respect to sigma dot. This again as before is going to be a partial derivative of the utility uh, of, uh, of the expected uh, utility with respect to the wealth and then th we take the uh, partial derivative of the wealth with respect to sigma dot. And this turns out to be integral from minus infinity to infinity del u del w t into del w t into w t z f of z dz. So, this is the same as before except that now uh, we will have this additional z here and this can be, so which can be negative, positive or 0. So, remember that this is positive, this is positive and this is positive, uh, but we cannot you know depending on what your z is, uh, this entire term here can either be negative, positive or 0. Okay, so, this brings us to the end of this lecture. So, just to do a recap, what we did today is that we looked at the portfolio theory in the paradigm of utility functions. And uh, in particular, uh, what we did was we looked at an example of uh, a quadratic function, uh, quadratic utility function. And then uh, we talked about uh, 
uh, the expected utility at this maximization and we looked at a particular example uh, where we ex motivated why a log normal distribution is a better fit to uh, the through the return distribution of any particular asset during the holding period return and we looked at the sensitivity of the expected utility of that in terms of uh, the expected return and uh, variance of a continuously compounded convention being used. So, in the next class we will continue our discussion on a, a portfolio theory in the context of utility functions and then we will move on to looking at certain criteria uh, analogous to the mean variance criteria, but extended in this case to the non mean variance framework. Thank you for watching.